This is the fifth and final session of the CCS Christian Philosophy of Education series. I hope this has been helpful to you. In this session, we're going to take a look at some current issues in education, just kind of briefly giving our perspective, uh, giving some insights, hopefully based upon a biblical philosophy of education. So I hope this will give you some helpful thoughts. First, Let's think about the issue of public schools. After all, we're involved in a Christian school. We're involved in Christian education. So how should we as Christians think about public schools? Well, first remember what Deuteronomy 6 teaches us, as we've seen before, that uh, education is the responsibility of the parents. Uh, God commands fathers there to teach their children diligently, uh, and so on. And so education is a parental responsibility. In particular, in this context, it is not a responsibility of the civil government. God did not command the state of Israel to educate children. He told parents to educate the children. And so initially here we see that the education of children is not the responsibility of the civil government. Now, as we have seen before, though, uh, parents can hire others, parents can delegate this responsibility to others and can join together uh, for the education of children uh, with the division of labor type of thing, whether it's in a formal school setting such as we have or even in many homeschool co-ops where homeschoolers get together and say, well, you teach math and I'll teach science and this type of thing. Uh, but the idea is that parents are taking the responsibility for it. So the government in our day has said they are responsible for education. In addition to this, the education that we see in the public schools is pluralistic and humanistic. Pluralistic in the sense that they have no particular standard. Uh, they don't adhere to any one particular religion, except for the fact that they are opposed to the Christian faith. They are opposed to the idea that there is one body of truth, that there is one system of knowledge, that there is one savior. They're opposed to that, but otherwise anything goes. And they're humanistic in that everything that they teach is based upon man. It's man-centered. Uh, there is no external standard of right and wrong. Now having said that though, there could be situations that warrant sending your children to a public school. Uh, I'm thinking if you have a child who is severely learning disabled, for example, uh, there may be no Christian schools in the area that have programs for learning disabled students. And you may not be able to teach them at home for whatever reason, or for valid reasons. And so it might be that you need to send your children to the public school. We had some good friends who were very committed to Christian education, lifelong commitment commitment to Christian education. They had a teenage son who simply did not do well academically. He worked, he uh, tried, his parents worked with him. He was just not an academic student. He was gifted in uh, auto repair and auto mechanics and those types of things. And so his parents in high school uh, sent him to the local public school uh, so that he could get more training in auto mechanics and technical areas like that. Now, they went into it with their eyes wide open, knowing that their son was going to get bombarded with humanism, and so they were ready to combat that. And so if you are in a situation or somebody you know that needs to send their children to a public school, if there's some unusual circumstance, they need to be aware that it's going to take a lot more work on their part, on the part of the parents, to combat what they're getting into with um, their children. They need to combat the humanism they're going to be getting all day long. Uh, I do think those situations are unusual and rare. I don't think it's a should be a common thing that we say, well, I just need to send my child to public school. We also need to realize that for teachers, they may see going into the public schools as a mission field. and This is perfectly valid. Uh, as I've mentioned before, we have friends who are missionaries in the Middle East in sensitive areas. They have to be very careful and work undercover as far as ministering the gospel, but they do what they can to try to build bridges and to minister the gospel as they're able to. 
And so public school teachers may be in the same situation. They can't get up in the front of class and pray and talk about Jesus as we can in the Christian school, but they can build relationships with students. They can start ministering to them on a personal level. Uh, there are things that they can do. So this may be a thing where uh, teachers go into the public schools in a sense as missionaries and view it as that. However, don't send your children to the public schools as missionaries. Children are not missionaries. We don't send 10 year olds to deepest, darkest Africa as missionaries. Okay, uh, They're not ready for that yet. Uh, think about the nature of a school. The nature of a school is that students are there to be taught. Everything in the school is designed for the students to be taught, not to be teachers. And so you should expect that students are going to be taught. So don't think, well, I'm going to send my child to the public school so that he can be a light to the world, something like that. Um, if your child has to be in public school for some other reason, then yes, teach them how to minister the gospel around them, but don't send them with that purpose in mind. We don't send children off to be missionaries. Okay, another issue, the relationship of home and school. And we've talked about this um, in a previous session. Again, the Deuteronomy 6 passage. Parents have the responsibility for education. So they have the ultimate responsibility. There's the division of labor concept that uh, we may be better equipped and better talented at teaching than parents are, and so they ask us to do it for them, and that's fine. Again, we don't see parents as being ultimate over the school. They have input. We ask for their advice. We ask for uh, feedback from them, but they don't make the decisions in the school. We are partners, though, with the parents. We want to work together with them. And we have a free market perspective. If we are not doing a good job. If the parents don't like what we're doing, they're going to go somewhere else and the school's going to go out of business. And so there's this free market approach. Now, we have to be careful, and it's increasingly in our day, this idea of helicopter parents, of the parents who are hovering over their children constantly and are uh, just getting involved. I've talk, talked with uh, college administrators who have said that they are running into this more and more that you have parents who call their children each morning at college to make sure they're up and ready to go to class. You have uh, parents who call the professors about grades. And so uh, it goes on even into college. But we see this here uh, to a great degree, where you have parents who want to know everything that goes on in the class, that uh, they want to try to shelter their children and uh, do everything they can to push their children to success and to see that everything goes well with them. One thing that I heard recently that helped me along these lines is the idea when you look in scripture, it says that through many trials we must enter the kingdom of God. The Bible teaches that we are made stronger, we are made more like Christ as we go through trials and tribulations. As we suffer failures, it drives us closer to Christ. Well, when parents seek to intervene, and when parents try to prevent their children from experiencing failure or experiencing difficulty, the parents are preventing their children from growing closer to Christ. If trials make us more like Christ, and if parents are trying to do away with trials and troubles for their children, then they're taking away something that God uses to make the children more like Christ. Children need to learn failure. They need to learn hardship. They need to learn uh, difficulties. Now, this doesn't mean that we just go out of our way purposely to make life miserable for the students, but it does mean that as they are challenged, as they are working, and they come across something difficult, this is something that can cause them to grow spiritually. So this is one way to approach the idea of helicopter parents. All right, another issue. No child left behind in the last uh, couple of decades or past number of years, especially uh, since uh, the George W. Bush uh, administration, you had this public school initiative, No Child Left Behind. And the, there were some things that were good about it uh, because there was an expectation of results. 
uh, and uh, educators as administration looked at public school settings they saw the children were graduating and were not learning and so they wanted to put into place measures to see that the children would learn they expected results they wanted the schools to demonstrate this and there would be consequences for the failure of schools if they didn't demonstrate adequate yearly progress then the schools could come under various sanctions including having the whole school board dismissed and the school taken over by the state and so uh, there was some accountability there to show that they were getting results. And there was that, so that was a good motive that they had. The problem was how this ended up being worked out. There was a problem particularly of high stakes tests. High stakes tests are tests that students take. Sometimes it's just one test that determines their entire future or it determines the entire future of the school. So that you have the student's performance on one test ends up deciding whether school is going to be placed on probation or not, whether they're going to lose funding or not. And this led to the case in the Atlanta public schools of teachers changing the marks on students' tests, of teachers cheating so that their students would get higher scores. But also the idea of high stakes tests, even apart from No Child Left Behind, you have uh, in the public schools a lot of times you have exit exams or end of course tests uh, where the student can go through the whole class and then they have to take one test at the end to see if they pass the class or not. Well, some students don't do well on tests. That's just the way it is. Yeah, that's the way it is. Some students, they might have a flu that day or they might not be feeling good that day or something might have happened at home where they don't do well on the test and if everything rides on that one test then they're in trouble. So we don't like this idea of high stakes tests. Even with the SAT for example for college entrance you can take it several times and we encourage students to take it several times uh, rather than saying okay it all depends on one test. The solution to deal with the problem of expectations and of having results again goes back to the free market. If parents, if there's a true free market, if parents really can choose what school they want their children to go to, they're going to choose the schools that are doing well. And if a school is not doing well, parents will choose to go somewhere else. So if there are true options for parents, uh, that will deal with this whole issue of needing results. Next issue, Common Core Standards. This is becoming more and more prevalent. It's something that we are looking at as we look at our curriculum. Uh, some things that are driving, as you've heard, the Common Core State Standards is how it works out. Some things that drive this is a desire for consistency. Educators have found that uh, different states have different groups of standards for what children should be learning, and they find that their standards differ from state to state. And so a child might be learning uh, two-digit multiplication in third grade in one state. They go to another state and they don't learn two-digit multiplication until fourth grade. So the child has to sit through learning it again. Or if they move the other direction, they, the child never learns two-digit multiplication. And so uh, with the consistency and also with the increased mobility of our society where students do move, from one district to another, from one state to another. There was a desire that the standards should be consistent so that a student who's in third grade in one state is learning the same things that he's learning in third grade in another state. There's also a desire to reduce the number of standards. If you look at some of the lists of standards for public schools in some states, people have said that it would take 20 years to teach all of those standards or for one particular grade level. It might say that the fifth grade standards, the things that are covered there that students are expected to learn, it would take teachers three years to teach what is expected in fifth grade. And so uh, the standards are just very unworkable and unwieldy. And so the Common Core Coalition uh, came together to say, how can we reduce this to what is essential and what is most important? Now, these standards are not federal standards. It's not a national curriculum. It's not a national set of standards. There's an organization, the Common Core Standards Coalition, that developed these and then different states have had the option of 
adopting them or not adopting them. Uh, as it turns out, about 46 or 47 states have adopted them, but it's not a national, federal type program. The Common Core Standards are focused on college preparation. In fact, they have talked with teachers, college professors, and have said, what should students know when they come to college? And so they've designed the standards around that. Uh, so all the way from kindergarten through 12th grade, the focus is how can we prepare students to enter college? At this point, the Common Core Standards only cover English language arts, and you'll see that abbreviated as ELA when you start reading about it, ELA and math. Uh, other standards in social studies and science will be coming soon, uh, but at this point that's the only areas that the standards cover. ELA includes reading in the content areas. Uh, educators have learned that students have focused on literature in reading, reading novels, reading classic literature, to the exclusion of reading nonfiction, of reading things, uh, other types of material. When they get to college, students are rarely going to be reading literature. They're going to be reading textbooks. They're going to be reading essays. And so it was determined that students in school should learn how to read these other things. Skills are different when you're reading a science book, for example, than when you're reading literature. You're reading literature, you're looking for plot, you're looking for character development, uh, you're looking for a storyline, you're looking for those types of things. There's not a lot of character development in a science textbook. But you do, as you're reading science textbook, you need to start looking for procedures, you read for details, you read for vocabulary. There are things that you focus on in a science book that are different than a math textbook or a history textbook. So there are different skills involved in reading in the different content areas. So the Common Core ELA standards include teaching students how to read in the different content areas, not just literature. Like I say, these have been adopted by most of the states. Um, now, the standards are not Christian. Okay? They're not explicitly Christian. There's nothing there that we would say, okay, well, this is Christian standards. However, I do believe that as Christian educators, we should be aware of them and we should be able to respond to them. Uh, as we develop our own curriculum, people from outside, whether it's accreditors or whether it's parents, are going to say, well, at the other schools, they follow the Common Core standards. What do you do? So we should at least be familiar with them to the point where we can say, okay, we follow these standards because we think they're good, or we don't follow these standards in these places, and here's why, so that we can intelligently discuss them and intelligently know whether we follow them or not. So I'd like to look just at some examples of the Common Core standards, just so you'll see what we're talking about. This strand is from the phonics and word recognition standards. And so you see there's a standard for K-5, for first, for second, for third. And the overall standard is that they know and apply grade level phonics and word analysis skills in decoding words. But then they break it down as to what that means on each grade level. So you see in the K-5 level, demonstrate basic knowledge of one-to-one -one letter sound correspondences and so on. First grade, know the spelling sound correspondences for common consonant digraphs. Second grade, distinguish long and short vowels. Uh, third grade, be able to know the meaning of the most common prefixes and derivational suffixes. And so these are things that shows how the standards are progressive through the grades. In high school, here's the standard from literature that deals with craft and structure. You see, one of the things that the Common Core Standards focus on in ELA is analysis of the text. They have found that uh, a lot of teaching and literature and reading tends to take the students away from the text. And so they'll read something and then the stu students will be asked, okay, what do you think about this? Or have you seen something like this in your own life? Well, a lot of students can answer that without ever having read the book and without really digging into the book. And so they want to ask questions that point the students back to the text. So here's an example of craft and structure. Ninth and tenth grade, learn how to analyze an author's choices concerning how to structure a text. 
how to order events within it, such as parallel plots, and how to manipulate time to create such effects as mystery, tension, or surprise. It's pointing to, let's look at what the author did to bring about the result he wanted, to cause mystery. How did he craft his book that way? On the 11th to 12th grade level, the same type of thing. How did he structure parts of the text, such as whether to begin or end a story? How did that contribute to the overall structure and meaning? So you point the students back to the text again, and questions are asked that say, okay, show me this in the text, and how does the text show that the author meant such and such? One more example. This is from math. We see here a fifth grade fractions unit about adding and subtracting fractions with unlike denominators. And then in the high school, a standard that talks about translating between the geometric description and the equation for a conic section. And so these are just some examples of how the Common Core standards work. And like I say, we'll be talking about this and dealing with it more uh, in the future. All right. Another uh, issue in education is the issue of constructivism. You may have heard of constructivism if you've done much reading in the educational realm. The idea here is that for students to learn well, they must actively construct their learning and knowledge. That is, students take the information and build their knowledge and their learning from it. They're not passive receptors of learning. In fact, students are active and they take their minds, take part in constructing their knowledge. Now, this can be seen in a relativistic way. That is, each individual student decides what's true and false for him. He decides what's right and wrong. He looks at the data and, okay, well, what do you think Lincoln meant here? And what do you think Lincoln meant? And they can be contradictory, but uh, that's all each student's doing it for themselves. It can be that way. But it doesn't have to be. We can see this from a biblical perspective. You see that we can look at constructivism and say that this is students having dominion mentally over the world, that it's students being active. As we saw in the book of Proverbs, there's the teaching through riddles and figuring out riddles. Students should not be just told the answers all the time. They should be allowed to figure things out. That's what constructivism is. Uh, I have a whole video on constructivism, so if you would go to the website that's going to pop up on the screen here, uh, you'll find this video and other videos I've done as well on different educational topics. Now let's look at equality and diversity, this whole issue. Uh, this is another big issue. I, mean, I heard a speaker say that uh, a Christian speaker said that he talked to his teenage daughter one time and asked her, okay, what is the worst thing that people could accuse you of? And she said, the worst thing people can accuse me of is of being intolerant. Not of being sinful or anything like that. It's like, okay, the worst thing that you don't want to be accused of is being intolerant. That's where our culture has gotten to. Now, we have to see biblically there is racial and ethnic equality before the Lord. No race is superior to another. No ethnic group is inherently superior to another. Uh, they're all equal before the Lord. However, our culture has changed that into lifestyle equality. That is, that no matter what lifestyle you ch choose, whether it's homosexuality, heterosexuality, uh, whatever religion you choose, that that's all equal, that it makes no difference. It's just kind of what, how you choose. We have to see that Scripture does divide people. Scripture divides. It says that God, Jesus said he came to set father against mother, sister against brother, and so on. But the dividing line that Scripture places is Christ, not race. So people are divided. Are you for or against Christ? There's the division not a racial division. This issue of tolerance. There's a biblical understanding of tolerance in the sense that God says that we are to love our enemies. We are to love all men. Love means fulfilling the law. And so if I have a neighbor who is a homosexual, uh, love means fulfilling the law. I don't have the right to go and execute him. God hasn't given me that right to carry out execution. 
In fact, I am to show love. I'm to show kindness to him. I am to bring the gospel to him. But I'm also just to show kindness as Christ has shown kindness to me. That's biblical tolerance. Unbiblical tolerance is just saying, well, that homosexual, homosexual is just as good as I am. That there's no difference between his lifestyle and mine. And if I try to tell him that he's wrong, if I try to tell him that he's sinful, then I'm being intolerant. That's an unbiblical view of tolerance. Tolerance does not mean that we look at everything as equally valid. Tolerance means that we treat others as God treats us, with compassion, with kindness. We treat them according to what the law of God says. Okay, I'd like to thank you for watching these videos. This is the conclusion of our series. I hope this has been helpful for you. For those of you who are teachers at CCS, uh, this is just one portion of the requirement for your philosophy of Christian education requirement for your certification. Uh, you also have a paper to write, uh, you have several books to read, and there's a form to fill out when you've concluded all that, and you can find all those resources here on the iTunes U site as well. Uh, so be sure and do those. If you have any questions about this or anything, be sure to contact me. Uh, my email address uh, will be popping up on the screen, and I would look forward to hearing from you. So again, thank you for watching this, and may our Lord be glorified.